this morning, I want to start by asking you a question. And I want to ask you this. Is there somebody in your life whom it is really difficult to love right now? And you can identify that person. Now, don't look to the person beside you and start tapping them on the shoulder. Don't start pointing. That's just get really uncomfortable. Grace, right? We're all about grace here. But is there somebody that you can think of in your life that they are just so difficult to love? Maybe it's a coworker, a boss. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a dad, a mom. Maybe it's a spouse. Yeah, like they just don't agree with what I agree with. They just they second guess me all the time. Just always wanting to start an argument. Let me ask you another question. Are there a group of people? Is there a group of people that are just very difficult for you to love? Think about that one. Well, they just have different preferences. They have different religious beliefs. They have different political views. Well, they just, they're not in my area. I don't see them enough. They're overseas. They're in areas that I'll just never get to, and I just can't be concerned with them. I've got way too many things on my plate to worry about. They're a group of people that are just so difficult for you to love. You know, this story, this idea of missions is centered around an event. It's centered around something that God realized long ago that he would do, and when the time was right, he did. He sent his son for you and I, a New Testament believer, to die on a cross, to be raised from the dead, that you and I may have life and have it to the full and have it eternal. That one day when we die, we can spend eternity with him. That's a story of grace, something that we did not deserve. We should have been on that cross, and he chose to put his son that's a story of grace. And it's every day that we're learning this, I'm learning this, of what it means, that I, I mess up all the time, but yet this gospel story gets deep into my heart and it causes change. It has to. And it messes things up. It messes up my wills and my desires, which I'm not necessarily happy about. And it begins to change me. It begins to do something within me. It begins a process and a and, and uh, sets me down a path that causes me to look at things differently and focus differently. I love what Tim Keller says. He says, the gospel tells me that I am far worse and more flawed and more sinful than I imagined. And watch this, and yet simultaneously I'm more loved and accepted by God than I have ever dared hope. Isn't that amazing? And that's the truth. That all the garbage that I've done, everywhere that I've been and what I've done, and, and how flawed I am, simultaneously God is reminding me of his love and his grace and his story, which is redemption and forgiveness. Last week, I loved how Megan kicked this thing off. We're going to have to make this a, a policy where she kicks off every mission's month. She does such a great job. Did it last year and this year. And, and she took us into the book of Acts and a story of Priscilla and Aquila. And very quickly, you'll be reminded that uh, these two individuals did something that was, was just unique and, and different than what anybody else would probably have done to where they not only opened their home, they were hospitable. They opened their home to people to come in and stay with them, Paul and, and others. But then Megan taught us that there was something else that was so critical to their lives that they, they saw needs. They were open to these needs. Their eyes were open, and they wanted to be aware of them, and they saw needs. But we can stop right there, can't we? Oh, that person needs this, or this person could use this, or this family. But then sometimes we, that's where we draw the line. But see, these two taught us that there's more to it then now we've got to be intentional. And so we learned that they opened their home up even more. They would bring in people who, who knew God, but they just they, they kind of had a flawed reality of what Scripture said and doctrine, and they, they would teach them and take the next steps, and it was uncomfortable. They would do things were not the social norm. As we go through this this month and experience what God's doing in so many other countries, we're going to springboard that in the next month in November and bring it a little more back to home here. What is God saying to you? What is he challenging you? What is he, he just speaking to your heart? I want you to do this. I want to move you in this direction. 
Because we think about it, a lot of times it's really focused on what we know about the people in the situation, whether we want to get involved. God's saying, I want you to do this, or, or I'm, I'm showing you this need that this person has, and I'm showing you this country, and you keep seeing it, and, and it's not a coincidence. You keep thinking about it, and, and I want you to experience that, but yet we, we rationalize. God says we rationalize. I don't know. I mean, my, I got this going on. I got a family. I've got, you know, Bill. I just, I just can't. It just doesn't. It's not right timing. And we begin to play this mind game within ourselves, and we think we know what's best for us and forget about what God is saying. And so when it comes to missions, so often we focus on, well, I want to have a heart for missions. I want to have a heart for lost people. But maybe there's another question that we're forgetting altogether, and it's this. What does God think about lost people? Have you thought about that? What does God think about lost people? We want to explore that this morning, and by doing so, we want to look at a story in the book of Jonah. But what does God think about lost people? You see, when we allow his story to become our story and change our perspective and start seeing things through his eyes, recognizing it's all about him, it's not about me. Oh, Brian, you, you preached a great sermon today. Yay, me. Or, thank you, Jesus, you were exalted. You were made much of. It changes our thinking. When that happens, we begin praying differently. We begin approaching the throne of grace a little bit different. There's a... a a TV show that came out last year, and it, it, it's called New Amsterdam. The lead actor was a, an actor in another uh, show that Kim and I used to watch, and we really, really liked the show. We still do. And he went to this one and started this show. He died on the other one, so he obviously couldn't go back to that one. So he started this show. And we started watching this, and, of course, now it's taking turns and things. We're like, oh, do we keep watching or not? But the premise behind this is, his name is Dr. Max Goodwin. He goes into this hospital in New Amsterdam, centered in New York. It's one of the oldest known hospitals around and is severely understaffed, severely underfinanced, uh, um, in debt, and severely underappreciated. And so he goes in and, and changes the whole culture, starts to do things that just are like completely you know, outside of the norm. You just don't do this. And exploring different ways for patient care. And, uh, but the very beginning of the, the series, the pilot, when it first started, he's going around and having conversations with all of his employees, and he would ask one question. It was a center focus for him. It still is. How can I help? Go to the cardio unit. How can I help? Cardiovascular unit. How can I help? ER. How can I help? We got this problem. How can I help? And I just wonder what that would look like in the scheme of missions, if we would just go to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and just say, God, you don't need me, but you want me, and I'm here, and God, how can I help? How can I help? What can I do? Could that change our focus, change our perspective? So we want to look at this through the eyes of a man named Jonah, and this is a short book in the Old Testament, four chapters, very quick. And when many of us have read that, we, it's synonymous with one thing, what? A big fish. Jonah got swallowed by a giant Nemo. And that's about all we, we think about, right? But there is so much more to this story. And you've got to grab this this morning. Please latch on to this this morning. Jonah chapter 1. We're going to go through the whole book. We're not going to read it all, I promise. We're going to highlight a couple things in each chapter and try to grab a couple real truths that I think could uh, challenge each one of us. Uh, in spreading the gospel and trying to answer this question, what does God think about lost people? So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Jonah. If you want to get on your devices, you can do that as well. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship and bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now look at the very beginning of this. It's, it's imperative that we see the very, in the very first verse of this chapter, the, the word says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. You see that? That's what started it all. 
And so for us, we've got to grab this point right out of the gate, that when it comes to missions, it starts with God. Plain and simple, it starts with God. He initiates it. He initiates the call. It doesn't start in a boardroom, in a meeting room. Isn't that great? You gather around and say, how are we going to do? No, it starts with God. When we meet, when our staff meets every Tuesday, when our board of elders meet, when our our board of ministries meet, we don't have an idea from somebody and and comes in and everybody's like, oh, yeah, great, let's just go do it and just jump on board. No, those ideas come in, those, those visions that are coming from the Lord, it's through prayer, it's through, you know, really seeking the Lord, and then we come to that meeting and, and we, like, for instance, the elders, and we gather and we, we, okay, let's pray about that, let's get in the Word, let's take some time and see what is God saying, he begins to speak to all of us, and we, we begin to speak in one language, the same language, and then we move forward, but we recognize it all starts with God. Years ago... Uh, many people were flooding Africa and bringing the word of the Lord and the gospel to Africa. And, and most of, a lot of people saw this and were saying that, that missionaries brought God to Africa. These missionaries are bringing God to Africa. And at, at one point, a villager stands up and says, that's not right. That's not right. It's not that God brought, missionaries brought God to Africa. God brought missionaries to Africa. That's a shift in posture a shift in our thinking. We recognize it all starts with God. So we see that right here off the bat with Jonah. The word of the Lord came. Well, the word of the Lord came and told him what he was going to do. I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, we need to understand Nineveh is the modern-day Iraq. All right, It was a great city. It was a big city. It was a problem city. Sin abounded. Adultery, misuse of, of funds, management of money, And on and on and on, just evil things happen. And God says, I want you to go there. And it wasn't a question. You ever have these conversations with your kids, parents? Hey, would you please go take out the garbage? Hey, would you please go clean your room? Would you please come out with me and we're going to do something outside together? In your mind, you know what that means. Yeah, it's a question, but it's just a way of nicely telling them what you want them to do. I'm going to make it in the form of a question. Well, your kids, being notre that they are, very smart and intellect, intellectual, they challenge you. Well, I, I, thanks, Dad, but I, I, I prefer not. Whoa, <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you asked, and I really don't want to do it, so I'm not. No, wait, see, that's not the way this works. It was a question just because I'm trying to be nice. The reality is it's a statement, but that's not what you said. Isn't that frustrating? Anybody can offer me help in that. I'll be in the back after church. <laughs> God did not ask a question here. He did not say, Jonah, would you please, I'd like you to go to Nineveh. Would you no, he said, you're going to go. It's a directive. And Jonah, a prophet, says, okay, well, uh, yeah, no, I'm going this way. He goes down, he charters a boat, which is interesting. It says he pays the fare. But in reality, if you read all of the book, you see that there's sailors on that boat. There's a captain on that boat. There are no merchants. So the reality of this is, He saw this boat going to Tarshish. He went down and he basically chartered it. He bought it. He's like, I see where you're going. I'm buying it, so we're going to go where I want to go. If anything changes, I'm going to tell you what to do. Well, okay, sure. Paid the fare. Away he goes. What we've got to understand about Tarshish, it's probably somewhere southeast of Spain. But the reality is what we do know is to the Israelite, to the Jew, it was the farthest place you could go. So what's Jonah saying here? God wants me to go to Nineveh. I'm going the complete opposite direction. I'm going over here. And it says he ran twice in the same verse. He ran. He was fleeing. He was making it a point that I'm getting as far away as I can. Now, this is hilarious when you think about it because I think he knew that you can't run from God. Wherever you go, God's going to be there. And so the reality is he's running from the directive God gave him for the plan God has for him, for him. but in a sense, the reality is he's running from God's will, correct? Amen? You see it? You know what the problem is here, what we don't want to hear, is that we're Jonas, aren't we? I'm a Jonah. You're a Jonah. I said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. And the Bible says he ran, he fled, he, he left and get as far away as he can. God's saying, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to send you to Nineveh, and you're going to have everything you need. And Jonah's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to do it my way. I, I'll pay for it myself. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. 
my way. As we continue to read this story, a storm comes. This is where it gets really fun. And the boat's almost going to capsize, and the sailors are getting incredibly um, concerned and scared for their life, and they start praying to their gods and, and start throwing stuff overboard to try to make sure that it, the boat gets lighter and maybe they can steer it. And, and the storm keeps getting worse, and the captain goes downstairs, and what's Jonah doing? The dude is sleeping. And this just in this couple little mini waves at the beach, this is a major storm, and he is sleeping. Interesting that we can sometimes feel, and think about this, we can feel that we're in God's will, and we can have a peace and be like, oh, I'm in God's will. I have peace. I know I'm doing God's will. I can sleep good at night. I got no problem sleeping. Really. And again, this battle in our mind that can take place. Are we really doing what God is asking us to do? So the captain says, who are you? you got to pray to your God. You see what's happening here. And, and they knew that he was running from God, the scripture tells us. And he's like, well, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew. I'm, I'm from this town. And, and I, I, I worship the Lord. And I didn't really want to do what he wanted me to do. And so this storm's because of me. I mean, if I'm the captain, I'm like, we're going to end this right now. And they're having this conversation, and God's like getting, he's on a time clock here, even though typically he's not really on a time clock, but he's like, okay, we're going to speed this up a little. He makes the storm get worse. And Jonah's like, you know what, just throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard, and this storm will cease. Now, I don't know about you, but that's probably not the direction I would have gone. I just started by like praying, God, please stop this storm. I messed up. It's my fault. I'm sorry. I'll go wherever you want me. We'll turn this boat around right now. Please stop the storm. But his stubbornness, he wasn't praying at all. Everybody else is to their gods. He's not praying at all. He's like, just throw me overboard. And the sailors start having conversations with one another, one another and the captain, and then they're pleading with God, oh, God, please don't hold us accountable for doing this. And eventually they're like, okay, enough's enough. You got the feet, I got the head. One, don't even count. Let's send him over. There he goes. The storm calms. And the Bible tells us that the sailors and the captain were so amazed. They were trying to row back to shore and they couldn't get there. And they're, they're amazed at this. It says they started worshiping the Lord even to the point where they were having sacrifices. And then at the end of chapter 1, the Lord provides a great fish. That word provide, we're going to see that a couple more times throughout this story. He provides a great fish who swallows him up. And then all through chapter 2, the whole chapter, finally Jonah starts to pray. And he has this beautiful prayer to God. It's beautiful interaction with God. Just confessing, oh, what I did, I messed up, I'm sorry, you are the great God. And, and I'm reminded again and... And just on and on and on. And then at the end, God realizes, all right, I got your attention. And the Bible says that he had the fish spit him up, or my version says vomit him up. That had to have been ugly. He vomited him on dry land. Incidentally, I don't know why he couldn't have put him in the water so that he could have rinsed off until he got to dry land, but it is what it is. The Bible says he vomited him up. And then we see in verse 1 of chapter 3, look at this with me. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. The second thing we need to see here, that God keeps pursuing us. Aren't you happy for that? That should have brought us to our feet with amens. God keeps pursuing you. Praise the Lord that he keeps pursuing me. Praise the Lord that he kept pursuing me when I came out of college and I was convinced I would never be a teacher because I saw from Kim, my wife, in, in teaching oh, that you, you know, the parents are just, they, they basically have their way. And you can't teach the, their discipline the kids like you could when I was in school. I mean, they took those paddles away. That was a good deterrent when I was growing up. You know, so I'm not going to be a teacher and forget about ministry or being a pastor because I'm an introvert. That's not going to happen. Thank the Lord that he kept pursuing me and gave me a second chance and a third and a fourth and a 56th. And by the time I was 29, 30, I'm doing both simultaneously. Hey, God, just up here, see, I told you, man. That's the way he talks to me. I told you, man. 
you keep going, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And when Jonah left and we tried to run away, God's not up there in heaven like, well, doggone it, I really like that one. Well, we got a couple more over here. I'll, I'm going to go after her. No, that's not how he works. He's up, all right, he wants to do it this way. I'm going to teach him this way. But I'm not done with him. And it says the word of the Lord came to him again. He keeps pursuing. And he says, Jonah, again, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, this whole time, Jonah's forgetting what God had already done for him. He just prayed it, by golly. Apparently, when he got spit out of that fish, his mind got all goofy again, vomiting in his ears. I don't know. But he forgets, and so he says, all right, God, I'm going to go. He goes into that city, and he had one message. Basically, going to say, all right, y'all. He was from the south. There's 40 days coming, and you're going to get judged. You're messing up. You're, you're sinning like crazy. And basically, if you don't change right now, uh, your city's going to burn. You're all going to die. That was his message to Nineveh, the Greenleaf version of that story. And then he goes up on this hill, and he kind of just sits across his arms like, all right, God, do your stuff. All the time thinking, I didn't have to come here to do this. I mean, I could have sent out an Instagram message to the king, and we could have ended this real quick. But I just had to do it your way. And he's sitting there waiting, all right, God, judge him. And then something absolutely amazing happens. It blows him away. He's watching this, and he's watching these villagers, and they start moving in the, in the direction of God. They're, they're posturing before God. They're, they're confessing their sin before God, and things start to change. And they're putting on the sackcloth. They're taking their clothes off and putting a sackcloth on, which is a, a symbol of, of mourning and a symbol of submission to God. And word gets back to the king, and he gets up off his throne and takes his royal robes off and puts on th sackcloth as well, and he's praying, and, and their whole attitude is changing. And all the while, Jonah's like, what is going on? This is not the way it's supposed to happen. The king puts in the law an edict with all his, his noble people, and he says, okay, we're not going to eat anything. Nobody's to eat. Nobody's even to drink. Don't even let the cattle eat or drink. And that's huge because that's their livelihood. They need them to eat. They need them to drink, get them big and fat so they can sell them and make a lot of money. And all of them, they're transformed in the days and weeks ahead. They're moving in the presence of God, and God's mission, God's story is, is impacting them. Jonah's like, what is going on? It's not supposed to be like this. To the point we see in chapter 4, look at this. It says that in verse 1, but Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord. He said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home, that that, that is what I tried to forestall or flee from to Tarshish? I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Psalm 103 is quoting as well. A God who relents from sending calamity. And then he says this. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better to me to die than to live. These suicidal thoughts that he's having, where he wanted to jump off the boat, and now this, and we're going to see this again in a couple minutes. Look how the Lord responds to him. He says this, is it right for you to be angry? Notice he didn't ask a question, why are you angry? Jonah, let's sit down and talk about this. Tell me what you're feeling. What's going on in your life right now? Talk to me. I'm your daddy. He didn't ask, did he? He said, what right do you have to be angry? This is a very important question. We're going to see this in a couple minutes as well. So Jonah is still angry. He's still mad. He's still thinking in his mind, maybe God's going to do something here that I want to see and, and keep to his word because his, he didn't do that. He had compassion on him and didn't destroy the city like he said he was going to do. And I love this part. Jonah goes off to the east side, it says. He sits down. He makes a little bit of shelter. And then he sits there again and waits. All right, God, I'm going to give you a second chance to do what you're really supposed to do with these people. And sometimes I know God has such a sense of humor. 
He just like, oh, I've been wanting to use this one. I've got this idea for a worm and a vine, and I've wanted to use it, and it's the perfect time. Finally, Jonah's given me the opportunity. Oh, angels gather around. You're going to love this one. I'm not sure it worked out that way, but in my mind it did. And so the scripture tells us this vine grows and gives Jonah shade. It's like you're in that hotel now. He, he starts to cool down. The AC's working, and he cranks it up, and he's feeling real good. It all happens like overnight, and just that quick. The Bible says God provided a vine, that same word provide that he used back when he provided that great fish. And then he provides a worm. The word says the worm came and ate the vine and down went the vine. And poor Jonah's head got really sunburned. And that hundred proof just wasn't working. And Jonah gets angry again. He's like, you got to be kidding me, God. Just kill me now. There he goes again. End my life now. I'm done. God responds this way in verse 9. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? There he says it again. About the plant. Jonah says, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty angry and I wish I were dead. The Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did nothing to tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Watch this. Please don't miss this. Verse 11. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Many cattle as well. Watch this question. If you grab anything today, this got to be the one. He says, should I not be concerned about that great city? What does God think about lost people? You were so concerned about your well-being, Jonah. You were so concerned about the fact that the air conditioning was working. You were so concerned about these little trivia things. You're missing the whole point. He says, I care about these people. Sometimes we allow our comfort to get in the way of what God is saying. We're so concerned about this. We're concerned if we can buy this. We don't want to relinquish these funds. We're concerned that, oh, God, I can't go anywhere. I've got a family here. I've got things to do. I'm, I'm vested in my work. I, I just, it's just not the right time. We're missing what God's trying to get into our hearts. You may have seen this verdict uh, of Amber Geiger that took place about a week and a half ago. She was the police officer, I believe it was in Texas, where she had come home and in the apartment she thought she was in her own apartment. Here she was in one below and uh, shot and killed a man, Botham, uh, G Botham John, I think his name was. And um, the trial came to a head and the sentencing was about a week and a half ago and people were hoping that were friends of the family, hoping that it was a life sentence and everything and it turned out to be 10 years in prison. And the videos that went viral, one of them, um, Botham's brother, uh, Brant, is that his name, Brant, who was um, uh, really affected, they say, the most of anybody. He, he was affected the most. And he sat on that witness stand, and he looked her in the eye, and he began to forgive her. And you may have seen this video. And he, he, he forgives her. And throughout his interaction with her from that witness stand, she's sitting at the table, he said, I just want you to receive Christ. And at the end, he looks at the judge. He says, Judge, Your Honor, may I please go give her a hug? And he pleads with her, please. And you see him come out. He's granted that right, and he comes out, and they embrace. And you see tears coming down. That courtroom was probably not a dry eye. And even the one video, you can see the judge, the tears coming down. And then the verdict was issued. And after it was done, the sentencing was the final. That judge, Judge Kelly, Tammy Kelly, or uh, uh, Kemp, excuse me, gets out of her, her chair and goes down and embraces a mom and dad. And I want you to see this. As she does that, she then leaves the courtroom and she comes back. And go ahead and start it. She comes back in carrying something. This is the wrong video. Do we have the, might we have it up there? No. Okay, we, we must not have it. Let me just explain briefly to you. So what happens, she comes back in, and she's carrying her Bible, and she goes to the, she goes to the, um, the, the table where Amber is, and she, she has a dialogue with Amber, and there's a guy 
uh, who's narrating this that I, that I wanted you to hear, but you can kind of get the picture. She hands her the Bible, and she looks at her and says, this is my Bible. I use it every single day. Here it is. And she takes this Bible, and she says, this is my Bible. I use it every single day. I've got many more other ones. But I want you to have this, and here's your job for the next 10 years. And she reads her John 3.16, and she begins to explain of what John 3.16 is. And then they get up. In uh, just a moment here, you'll see they get up and, and they embrace. And everybody's watching this, and people are like, I've never seen this before. I've never, I've never even seen this take place in a courtroom like this, especially with a judge. And as they're embracing, Amber's whispering in her ear, talking in her ear, saying, you're so good. You're such a good person. And she looks at her in the eyes and said, it's not the fact that I'm a good person. It's not about that. And this judge looks at her and says, it's about Christ, Christ in me. That's who I am, and that's what I want for you. And she explains this to her and pleads with her. The compassion, this gentleman is crying. The guy who was narrating is crying. There's people yelling out in the hallways and and stuff outside. I think we see a picture of that here. And yet the guy says at the end, that's a picture of what it is to have God's grace. I ask you this morning, do you have God's heart for mission? What does God think about lost people? He loves them. He wants them found. And do we have God's heart for that as well?